your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. If you're a guest with us, I want to say welcome. Uh, My name is Matt McDonald. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, I'm the lead pastor here at CGC, place to be, even on a Super Bowl Sunday. That's how my grandpa said Sunday. (laughs) Yes, Sunday. You can come on down there, Sunday. Uh, uh, We're glad that you're uh, with us this morning. Um, We're looking forward to see what God has in store. Um, it, it's, been, uh, it's been quite the start to the year. Uh, it's been quite the start to the series last week. Um, I- incredible Sunday time, just being with each other, being with God. Um, we had, those of you who are servant leaders, leaders, an incredible team night rally last Sunday night. Um, absolutely incredible time. If you've never seen DJ with a band behind him, <clears throat> it is a bucket list item for sure. Um, God bless whoever the drummer is, but it was, it was incredible. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, we've been in this series we started last week, uh, Holy Spirit, but in one sense, it feels, like, it feels like we've been here for a while. It feels like we've been um, expectant. It feels like we've been talking about. It feels like we've been learning about and asking God to show us the truth about who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, Last week, we talked a a little bit about it uh, as well. Who are you? Or who are you? Or who are you? Like the the different postures we take when asking who the Holy Spirit is, um, or maybe a stranger we run into at the grocery store. But it's been really incredible to hear some of the testimonies of what God uh, has been doing. I told you guys last week that I really believe um, what God is doing is much bigger than just what's going on here at Common Ground Church. But God is so good, we get to be a part of what God is doing, kingdom-wide, worldwide, in the big C church. We get to be a part of that because we are the body of Christ as well. And there's been some amazing testimonies coming out of Common Ground Church as well. I was talking with some of our elders this week, and and we just kind of sharing, like, this is what God has done. These are some of the testimonies we're hearing about people who feel, who have felt defeated, stuck, whatever, you know, fill in the verbiage of where you're at, but then experiencing the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is in their life. And how many of you know, it doesn't always change every circumstance that we find ourselves facing in the world, but it does give us a new outlook on them. Uh, It gives us a new sense of victory over them, doesn't it? And it, it extends even beyond that. I don't know how many of you have been hearing about, maybe you've heard a little bit about there's, there's very real revival going on um, in the world, in the country. There's something going on at Asbury College in Kentucky. Uh, they started a worship service on Wednesday morning, and it's still going. <laughs> College students, somebody say amen, started their normal chapel worship service on Wednesday morning. It is now Sunday morning, and that thing is still going. Yeah, absolutely. Like, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. And it's coming through this genuine desire, thirst, and expectation for who God is, for who the Holy Spirit is. What role does he play in our lives? And not even that, it actually starts with the idea of giving praise to the one who is worthy of praise, making sure we are setting God high above it all, Coming to him in repentance, not out of fear that someone's going to find out what we've done, but coming out of repentance in front of and in the presence of a holy God who, like, sin cannot survive in his presence. So repentance is kind of a natural byproduct because we feel the weight of our sin, not out of condemnation, not out of guilt, not out of shame, but out of adoration that we are in the presence of a holy God. I need to repent for everything. Lord, you are worthy. Forgive me. It is so good. It's incredible when you have this authentic encounter with the Holy Spirit like that, how you can simultaneously feel the sin in your life, but how you can feel it kind of rising to the surface as you're in the presence of a holy, loving God, because he's not here to out you. He's here to get the sin out of you. Uh, and so it's been incredible, the things that have been going on. I, I, I kind of want to drive to Kentucky. <laughs> I want to be up in that church service. I want to know what songs they're doing. I want to know what sermons they're preaching. But we talked a little bit last week, church. The, the question that we asked was, if you could only pray and ask God for one thing for the rest of your life, what would that one thing be? 
right? We, we learned about the idea that we cannot live this life effectively without being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. We can have some success in this life without the Holy Spirit, uh, according to what we define as success. That's usually where things start to get a little bit foggy, is what do we define success as? But we cannot live the Christian life that God has outlined for us in his word effectively without being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. And so that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to probably continue along in that a little bit. But this week, I'm just going to give you a full-on disclaimer, same deal as last week. Um, we'll see. I got some notes here, um, <clears throat> but we'll see what happens. Um, also, in terms of when this series is going to end, I don't know. Why don't you keep coming back next week and just see? Is it going to be the Holy Spirit still? Is it going to be Holy Spirit? Maybe it's going to be something different. Because this, uh, and usually I was telling uh, some folks this morning, our staff, I was telling some of our, our, our elders as well, like when I um, <clears throat> start planning a sermon series, I at the very least have a theme for each week an anchor text, and a theme for what that week's going to look like four weeks in advance. Um, and so I was talking to the team this morning. They're like, hey, so, um, so like, like what's the mm for this morning? What's like the... And I was like, I'll know it when I say it. <laughs> but I got a lot of different things here. And, and that's not out of a lack of preparation, because we could easily do that simply out of a lack of preparation. That's simply, that's simply out of church. I've fully and genuinely believe that the Holy Spirit has us as a church on the cusp of something that I want to make sure more than anything, I don't go through a planned sermon, but that I am aware uh, in, in discerning of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do each and every service and message that we have. Amen? So you can still take notes. They just might be all over the place. We might not have an acrostic. Or if we do, it might be on the fly. It might not all start with the same letters. Or maybe, maybe Robin, I'll just have a sermon where I, each point is one letter of the alphabet. <clears throat> And we'll just see how many letters we get through each Sunday. <laughs> Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. If you would, if you're able, would you please stand to your feet as we read the word of the Lord. Um, I'm going to read a verse from Acts chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, um, but it fuels into Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 1 uh, says this, but you will receive... Power. All right. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you will receive... Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Leave that up there for just a second. Um, I, I kind of want to speak to this, this chasm that I, I mentioned just a moment ago. A lot of times, if we're not careful, uh, as churchgoers, as veteran churchgoers, um, we start coming for what God can do for us. <clears throat> Instead of like the, the promise is we'll actually be able to do for God what he asks of us when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Will that include doing some of the things that in, in our life? Yes, absolutely. But, but the approach to our Heavenly Father, the approach to Jesus and asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it's so beneficial when the... Now, God can do anything. He can, he can, he can mess with your mind. He can, he can mess with... Not like in a bad way, like, hey, amen, I mess with him. But he can transform the way you're thinking, even if you don't approach with the right intentions. I'm not saying... But what I'm, doing, what I'm saying is us trying to get ourselves in the right mindset as we approach who the Holy Spirit is. We come to him knowing that he's going to empower us to do what he's asked us to do, right. not empower us to do all the things that we want to do. Yeah. Right. Everybody tracking with me? Yeah. So that, that is huge to know about the character and the nature of who the Holy Spirit is. Fast forward to Acts chapter 4. Now, between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 4, uh, I know I'm, there's a lot there. Lots of stuff happened. The Holy Spirit fell upon the people uh, who were there that Jesus and said, hey, go wait for my Holy Spirit. Miracles were happening. People were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. People were getting healed. People were getting delivered. All kinds of stuff. And we get to Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 13. And what was happening here is that Peter and John were before the council because they had been doing things in the name of Jesus by the power of Holy Spirit, setting people free, healing people. And in the council in the area was like, wait, 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 what's all this humbug going on over here? What's, what's, uh, what's all this brouhaha that's going on? I, I need to know what's happening. And so we get to verse 8 of Acts chapter 4, and then it says this, Then Peter, 
filled, say filled, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? I love that. You see Peter. Again, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just his good wit. It's Peter filled with the Holy Spirit matched with his good wit. <laughs> he says, wait, 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 let me get this straight. We're being questioned for a good thing we did for a crippled person. You want to know how we did it? You want to know? And he just keeps drawing them in, drawing them in. Verse 10 says, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. That was Peter's moment. <clears throat> that was Peter's moment. That was God's moment for Peter to declare the goodness and the healing power of who Jesus is. Peter would not have been ready for the moment if he had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever feel like, ah, I, I do this in arguments all the time. You ever think about the argument the day after you had it? I'm like, oh, why didn't I say that, that would have just, mm, oh. I've had that with job interviews before where I'm thinking back on the job interview. I'm like, why didn't I say the other thing? Oh my gosh, why didn't I do that? Now, I believe that God is sovereign. Uh, his ways are higher than my ways. So I believe that when it goes well, it's because the Holy Spirit filled me to say the things I needed to say and it went well. When I believe it didn't go well, I may not always know, but part of me thinks that, okay, that must have not been the place for me why is God going to fill me in that sense with his Holy Spirit to continue to walk down a road that isn't one that he set me out to walk down? So when it goes bad, don't sweat. Don't sweat. Anywho, verse 11 says, For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Verse 13, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. <laughs> they were ordinary men with no special training. I can't be going to ministering to people. I didn't go to Bible school. I can't be going. I didn't even finish seminary. Can I tell you something? Me neither. And a lot of people will not come to church here for that. I've had a conversation where the light goes off. They're like, hey, so where'd you go to seminary? I'm like, oh, the, the seminary of hard knocks. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll be back. We got some other churches to try. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. I, I, don't, I don't use that as a reason to not further educate myself on studying the scripture because I do and we do as church leadership. What I'm saying is we see here the birth of the church was happening through ordinary people with no special training. The only thing they had was the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit on their lives. You could be the most studied Christian in the world and have no power on your life. And God does not have his hand on the path that you are taking because you're more concerned with your intellect knowing to interpret what God says rather than experiencing who the Holy Spirit is because that's our helper that Jesus has sent us. Amen? Also, study the Bible more, like, in case you misconstrued that. Yeah, study this more. No, they were ordinary men with no special training in, in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Um, I think people should be able to see Jesus on us. Even if they can't say, oh my gosh, is that Jesus? But it's like, huh, what's, uh, what's that about? Um, and, and you know what, what's interesting is if I've had people that have come to church that I went to high school with, and, and, and some of them, some, none of them in this service, they might be, um, so there's some, they still come here, um, but sometimes I'm convinced half of them are coming, they need a church, half of them are coming to be like, let's just see. <laughs> I knew him in high school, I just, uh, 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 let's see. And, and that's not boasting in me, that's simply, like, Jesus should be on us, church. And it is, it is not a burden to do ministry in the same place 
that you were in before you knew Jesus. It's actually a blessing to do ministry in the same physical place before you knew Jesus because you know the power of a testimony, of a transformed life. Like, wait a second, I know what you used to do. I know who you used to be. I know the kind of things you used to say. I know the stuff you posted on Facebook. (laughs) But it's not matching up. Do you want to know how I did it? Do you, do you want to know what happened? Do you want to know how that happened? Come on in. Come on in. Invite your friends and family to see what the Lord is doing in this place. Because here's the thing, what we see in Acts chapter 4. When we have the Holy Spirit, we have strength in numbers. Now, strength in numbers isn't about quantity. It's not about having the most numbers. It's about having the right numbers. We have strength in numbers when we have the Holy Spirit. And your, inf- your, your effectiveness in life is going to be directly tied to your ability and willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit. So if you're taking notes, the, the message title so far is Strength in Numbers. Would you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We lift high the name of Jesus in this place this morning, in our hearts, in our minds. Father, we simply set the table and we want to invite you in right now to have a seat at the head of the table. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with ears to hear, with eyes to see, with a spirit to discern what it is you're speaking to us this morning. God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Thank you for the good news that it is by the name of Jesus we are saved. And thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit so we don't have to simply wait it out until this life is over. But we can live a life and life to the fullest and a life of power and victory. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. amen. Let's give God some praise in this place. Why don't you guys go ahead? You can have a seat. You can have a seat. Turn to the person next to you. Tell them who you're going for in the Super Bowl. Someone said Broncos. <laughs> the Rams. The Ra- <laughs> back to back, baby. <clears throat> I have a question for you. How many people you would call yourself a reader? Okay. What a, maybe you want to be a reader, but you're not quite there. Interesting. There's very few of those. <laughs> it's like people that aren't readers are like, I'm good. I am, I am all good in the hood. <laughs> you know, I've learned something about myself. I, I do not love to read. Um, I've tried to make myself love to read, and that has ended in a lot of frustration. Um, but one thing I do know is there is a lot of value in reading regularly. So I learned that I don't love it, but I also know that it's good for me. So I had to come to the adult decision that we have to with most things in our life. If we don't like something, but it's good for us, do it anyway. Uh, and so I've, I've tried to discipline myself to read versus trying to convince myself I am a lover of books, if that makes sense. Um, so in case anybody was needing help getting over that, there you go. Praise God. Be blessed on the way out. Um, <laughs> How many of you like when they turn, what about fiction lovers? All right. Nonfiction? That's me. That's me. I want my fiction from the TV, not the books. How many of you like when they turn your beloved books into movies? All right, there we go. Come on, me and Courtney, me and Todd, we are in it. Me, I see some hands in the back. It's real dark right there, but come on, I'm with you. I, I like it. See, what I like to do actually is, since I know how badly they often butcher it, um, I like to wait and watch the movie first. <laughs> I just told you I wasn't a reader. <laughs> I like to watch the movie first and then tell myself I'll read the book after um, to enhance the story. I did it once. And it worked beautifully. Like I watched the movie and then I read the book. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Because then it's filling in gaps and enhancing something instead of letting me down for not being what I knew it to be. So guys, it works for me. It doesn't have to for you, but it works for me. And I've not done it since. It was one time. And so now I watch the movie and tell myself, all right, now I'll read the book. And you know what happens when the book comes up? I'm like, "Ah, I've already seen the movie. (laughs) It's hard. So it, no, no matter how you feel about it, um, we all probably end up watching it, don't we? Yeah. 
We, we, we watched the movie that was made from the book. If nothing else, to, to be a critic and see how badly they're going to mess it up. Uh, my daughter is in fourth grade, and she recently had the assignment to read the book Wonder um, with her fourth grade class. And so we, we saw the movie years and years ago. Um, and so she wanted to watch the movie again. She really badly wanted to watch the movie. So we watched it again yesterday. And I can't tell if, if it's because I'm a parent. I can't tell if it's because... Uh, I'm getting older. Uh, I can't tell. I, I like to think it's because the Holy Spirit is softening my heart, so that's what I'm going to go with. Man, I cry in movies so easily, it's especially when it's parents and kid like dynamic. I'm sitting there watching. Like, it could be a Dawn commercial. <laughs> and it's like the little kid willingly brings the Dawn up to mom. Here you go. I helped. <laughs> How did they make him do it? Love? And then I turn and do the dishes and my kids are laying on the floor like, why can't you help me? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting soft in my old age. Uh, and so I, I, we're watching this movie Wonder and I can't like the sleeves on my shirt. <laughs> uh, and we get to this. If you haven't seen it, I'll... I'll, I'll ruin a little bit of it, but not all of it, so don't worry. Um, it gets towards the end of the movie, and, and the, the story centers around this kid named Augie. Um, and it's his first year in public school because of a condition he was born with, um, and he doesn't look like other kids, so he, he's been fearful of going because he doesn't want to get made fun of. Um, and so fifth year is his first, first year in a school with other kids. And so he's going to school, and we get towards the end of the movie, and it's him and his friend, and they're walking out in the woods because they're on this camp out thing, and these seventh graders follow him into the woods. And the seventh graders, real big, tough seventh graders, by the way, um, start picking on the fifth graders and like picking a fight with someone who is clearly like two feet smaller than they are. And so the seventh graders, naturally, they have the upper hand. Uh, and so they start messing with this fifth grader and his friend, but then something really, really incredible happens. And I won't ruin the whole movie, but, but like three more fifth graders come. Now, I've, I, I, when I was in my younger age, I used to tell me, like, I don't care how many of them are, they're small, I could take them. I can take them. I was a guy in my 20s, I would watch UFC featherweight fights of guys that weigh like 145 pounds, and I'm like, I don't care, I could take them. <laughs> no, no, they'll do that. I'm like, no, they can't do nothing to me. I just go, to, just hold on, and then just lay on them. Uh, let my weight go. <laughs> so I, I used to be that foolish and, and, and think those kinds of crazy things. And so I was watching this movie. I'm like, yeah, but they're fifth graders. Like, old ways die hard sometimes. I'm like, it's fifth graders. They're going to say But then something amazing happens. These fifth graders begin to work together, band together, and take out these seventh graders. As a fifth grader, I felt so vindicated. <laughs> Like the inner fifth grader in me that dealt with bullies when I was in school felt so vindicated. I was like, yeah, don't run, stay and hit them some more. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, like, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. I did not advocate for that. Just, we are not liable for any fights that happen after this. <clears throat> but what I did notice is that there is very much truth to this idea of strength in numbers. Because it wasn't just any fifth graders that came about. It was fifth graders who were for this kid. It was fifth graders who, who, if they weren't before, they were now. They were for this kid. And so it wasn't just a matter of a bunch of numbers. It was the right numbers because they were for this kid. They had his back and they handled business. It doesn't just mean the most numbers, church. It's the right numbers. Jesus gave the responsibility. P picture this in your mind for a second. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, he's basically saying, I'm about to build my church. You are going to be the laborers that help build it. You are going to be the ones that help build it. And so I I'm thinking, if you're anything like me, well, no, no, if you're anything like me, you'll just go, ah, let's go. If you're anything like Pastor Sean, you want some semblance of a plan, or, or at least, maybe not even a plan, but at least like, okay, what are we doing? What are we going to need? We went to the 4th of July thing last summer um, together, right? Was that was last summer at the Balloon Fiesta Park? And we get to the park, and uh, Pastor Sean is, is like the, such a better dad than me. He, he had all these snacks, all these blankets, all these chairs. I had a wagon. <laughs> we get to the field. My kids are like, I'm hungry. Like, oh. I probably should have brought some food, huh? 
go see what, go see what Pastor Sean brought. See if he's got any. <laughs> He probably has extra. <laughs> I, I sometimes get a little gung-ho, and I'm like, God, let's go for Narnia, and then just kind of full on, like, where's your sword? Ah, hold on, let me go back to the house. Me, ah, we got a horse. Okay, let me kind of get back up on the house. Come on, let me, ah. <laughs> so sometimes I run a little bit too quickly into the fire. But picture this, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. Acts chapter one, he says, go and wait for who I'm going to send you. Jesus leaves us with the responsibility of helping to build the church that he promises to build and essentially leaves us two things, two tools, two things. Now, if you're like, we're like, okay, I can think of at least 12 things that I'm gonna need. If you ever played the desert island game, like if you're on a desert island and you can only bring one thing, what would you bring? And someone's always like, fire. Like, you can't bring fire. You gotta. <laughs> so Jesus essentially leaves them with two things. Get this the Holy Spirit and a small group. He, he leaves them the Holy Spirit and a small group and says, build the church. Now, I don't know about you, but that speaks immensely to me, the value of the Holy Spirit and the small group. Now, a small group can look a bunch of different ways. Obviously, it's basically people who you do life with regularly that sharpen each other's faith and encourage each other's faith. If you have a problem putting meat on the bones with that yourself, that's why we have some for you. And say, get in one. If it's not a regularly scheduled one, you better have a group of people that you do life with. But here's the thing, to build the church. Not to be the church in your small group. Yes, you are the church in your small group, but that is not the extent of the church. The point of the small group is to build the church. How do we do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Two things he leaves us, the Holy Spirit and a small group. Now, that doesn't sound like strength in numbers on the surface. It sounds like two things. But remember, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. The Holy Spirit in a small group, I like our chances. I like what we got going for us. And so it's no wonder why the enemy works so hard to... Con the Holy Spirit is our helper. The small group is there to what? We can say it together. Help us. Help me, please. Somebody... We, I sound like uh, uh, Jack Dawson in the middle of the ocean. Trying to help me! I'm drowning. But it's not a desperation. It's a we understand who our helper is, the Holy Spirit, and where our help comes from, the Holy Spirit, and how the context in which we're meant to do that together. So the Holy Spirit and the small group have some value. It's no wonder the enemy works overtime to convince you to believe you don't need any help or you don't deserve help. Or, ah, uh, I've had enough help. Not just believe that idea, but actually boast in the idea that I don't need any help. I never need nobody. <clears throat> you see this thing? I can shoulder this thing. Yeah, until you die. And then, yeah, congrats, you died. <laughs> Shouldering a load that wasn't yours to shoulder. I never need nobody. I don't want anyone knowing my business. They'll judge me. They think different to me. So, we all have Facebook. We're judging you anyway. Like, <laughs> might as well do it in person with people so you can talk it out. <laughs> or my, my personal favorite, God, you've done enough. I've got it from here. Wow. Or I've been a Christian for a while. I should be able to do this on my own at this point. Isn't that one so crazy? We think we've received enough training apparently to do, like we, we approach this Christian life like we're training for a job where the trainer's with us for a while and then says, okay, see ya. I don't know about you, any job I've ever had, I've seen my trainer for the first two weeks and then never again. Like I saw them, but you know, I didn't see them. You are not out of, you have not graduated past the point of needing the help of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Christian maturity isn't thinking that you've gotten to a certain point where you don't need help. Right. Christian maturity is the realization that you need more help than you've ever needed. Each day, each day. God, I need more help than I did yesterday. 
Why? Because it's not your strength. It's the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. So maturity, that, that Christian maturity, isn't being able to shoulder more. The strength that you're asking God for isn't being able to shoulder more. It's because you're taking what is on your plate and you're giving that to God and you're bringing that to God so he knows he can actually trust you with more weight because he knows you're going to bring it to him. Otherwise, 10 pounds can really, really quickly feel like 100 pounds and 100 pounds can very, very quickly feel like 1,000 pounds. Why? Because we're carrying it all ourselves. I love, I saw this, this meme on the internets um, a while ago, and it was guys lifting a piano. They were moving somebody, and there was a guy on the side, and like he had the, like the edge of the piano, and he was just, he had two fingers. And he was <laughs> Everybody was like, man, you ain't lifting anything. <laughs> you are not helping at all. It felt like the, the others were obviously bearing the weight, but he, he was like, he, was, he wanted to help. <laughs> you could t- or he just didn't want to get in trouble for not helping. I, I, but for the sake of this sermon, guys, <laughs> he wanted to help. But look, all it took was that. And it felt like he was a part of the team. It, it took, a, a, have you, anybody ever moved before? Anybody ever moved a grand piano? I don't even know why they exist, to be honest with you. I think someone very, very mean invented those things a long time ago. I said, no, 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 it sounds better. I was like, okay, yeah, it kills backs. And I've seen the cartoons where it drops them. It's crazy. But many hands make light work. And so, and then you get home at the end of the day talking about, I moved a grand piano. I, we, we moved that thing. When you move, like you feel, and it's because of the help and the strength and numbers that was present at the time the work was required. And it's not always about quality because I don't want my kids helping me. Or it's not always about quantity. I could have four of my kids or four of my best friends to lift a grand piano. Can I tell you I love my kids? I would not choose them to help me move a grand piano. They're not at the place where they can be of help. But the Holy Spirit and the small group, the two things that Jesus left us to build can shoulder the weight of just about anything. The Holy Spirit is your helper. So you need to ask him for help. The Holy Spirit is the right number where we find strength in, but we need to ask him to lead us. It's called lordship. Say it with me. Lordship. What is lordship? Lordship is the actuality that you have submitted to he's the one that calls the shots in your lives, not you. But I can choose. You can. That's the, <laughs> my, my kids can choose to listen to me or not too. But it's going to go one of two ways depending on what they choose to do. The lordship of Jesus Christ is probably the most underrated, most under-talked about thing in the Christian life that will settle a lot of things in us. Because so often our struggles are fighting against the lordship of what God tells us to do. But your effectiveness in life is going to be directly tied to your ability to be led by the Holy Spirit. 10 o'clock. All right. Did it again. I've had these notes in our system for two weeks now. One of these days I'm going to get to them. We're going to get to the first one, though. So I, what I want to talk about this week and probably, um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, what I want to start talking about is, is, is three things, three different things uh, about the Holy Spirit, three aspects of who the Holy Spirit is to kind of help us to, to get a little bit better of a grasp on who he is in our life and how we uh, ought to and can invite him in and submit to him. Amen? Amen? So the first, I want to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. Say person. We talked a lot last week. He is a person, not an it. He's a person, not a thing. When I learned that, I started feeling bad anytime I would say it. Sometimes it happens, though. Like, you you ever, like, expecting a baby, and before you know if it's a boy or girl, you keep saying it? What is it going to be? And I, like, I feel so bad now when I say that, because I'm like, that's not an it, it's a human in there. But how else do you say it? What, what's that baby going to be? <laughs> what's that human going to be? <laughs> what, and, and so once, once we realize what it is we're actually saying is an error, we probably won't feel anything when we're in error. But the Holy Spirit is a person to be invited in and related to, not an it to carry around 
in your purse or your backpack. Pull it out whenever you need it. I was like, here's my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has a mind, will, and emotions. We see Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, other places in Scripture. We see that the Holy Spirit has a mind, has a will, and has emotions. What is that indicative of? A person. The Holy Spirit, we talked about this last week, is the one at work all throughout the New Testament and today. So we have God the Father. Where he at? In heaven. We have God the Son, Jesus. Where he at? In heaven. We have God the Holy Spirit. Where he at? In here. Earth agent. Earth agent. Earth agent. Oh, that's earth angel. <laughs> What's the key? Me, me, me. <clears throat> No, I won't do it again. (laughs) The Holy Spirit is the one at work today in your life. And and we see all throughout Scripture, and you can see in your life today, these personal acts of the Holy Spirit. He teaches people. He comforts people. He helps people. He convicts people. He guides people. He calls people. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, we see the Holy Spirit call Saul and Barnabas to service. It is a personal act calling someone into the service that they're calling. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this, is that the Holy Spirit will help you figure out what to do with your life. Anybody ever been there or is there or what, what is life? What should I do? Where should I go to school? What job should I take? Should we have kids? Should we have more kids? See, that's how you know it's the Holy Spirit. When you're crazy and decide, yeah, let's have some more. Let's just, let's have another one. This isn't crazy enough. Let's, let's, let's have some more. <laughs> Anybody ever been that place? Like, ah, I don't know what to do with my life. I have these choices. I don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit will help you figure out what to do with your life. Who has ever wanted to know what to do when they grow up? The Holy Spirit will tell you. We don't have to worry so much about figuring out what to do. What we need to be worried about is figuring out how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Listen, asking for prayer from other people is great. It is. But if you're asking for prayers from others without talking to the Holy Spirit about it yourself, you're going to be forever confused about what to do. And then you're going to blame people for making the wrong decision. You told me, I thought you were a person of prayer. You told me to take that job, not that job. I thought you were hearing from the Lord. Why don't you hear from him yourself? And then seek wise counsel. Because here's the thing, when we seek wise counsel, it's to get to that deep, deep part that you already know. You either just don't want to admit or you don't want to do it. But the Holy Spirit has revealed to us the counsel is to confirm, redirect, or get to that point that we seek in our life. But the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do and will lead you in what to do. Seeking counsel is about asking others to hear God with you, not for you. Seeking counsel is about asking, God, asking others to hear God with you, not hear God for you. If, we can, if anybody else can just hear God for you, what do you need to pray for? Ooh. Your effectiveness in life, church, is going to be directly tied to your ability to be led by the Holy Spirit. Ava, you can go ahead and come on up here. I'm going to land this plane short of all these notes again. I want to end with, with, with talking about this because the whole point of this morning's message is to help us understand something that I've said over. Your effectiveness in life is directly tied to your ability and willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us. It's pretty hard for the Holy Spirit to lead us if we only invite him into pieces of us. Tell me where to work, but don't, don't, don't be giving me any gifts. Like, tell me who to date, but don't be telling me what to do with my money. We got to invite him into the whole being of us. Invite him in. And, and, and here's, here's how we can begin. It, it may be, maybe it's a little too vague. Maybe it's a little like, okay, be led by the Holy Spirit. How do I know if I'm being led by the Holy Spirit? Here, here's where, where I will tell you to start. There's a difference between two wills of God in our life. 
There is the general will of God for all believers. And then there's a specific will he has for your life. But there's also a sequence to it. If you want to know the specific will of God for your life, you need to operate in obedience to the general will that God has called all believers to. And it's in here. So for instance, if, if you're asking God for prosperity, financial prosperity, Lord, give me, you know I will just build the church with it. Help me start this business and put all my life savings into it. And Lord, bless it. If we're not living in the general will of God, i.e. tithing, but we're asking him to speak on this specific will in our life, we're setting ourselves up not only for failure, but for frustration and for hurt and then blaming God because we wanted to cut corners. If you're wanting, if you're wanting to know who to date, who to marry, who to spend your life with, in this Disney world that we live in of relationships. Lord, is this the person I should marry? That's the wrong question to ask too soon. The question is, God, what do you say about relationships? See, the Bible tells us, not that we should get married, because Jesus wasn't married, but the Bible tells us if we're thinking about getting married, here, here, here's some parameters. Start there. But the Bible doesn't tell us who we should marry. I, I didn't go through my Bible, and I, I do a lot of translations, but I didn't see Caitlin anywhere in here. I said, Matt, go get her. Go get Caitlin. Get your life together and go get her. It, it didn't say that. You know what it said? Okay, you want that first? First, love me. You want to see if that's the person you should marry? Learn what my word says about marriage. Who should I marry? Who should I be in a relationship with? Who should I not be in a relationship with? How should I approach the construct of marriage from a biblical point of view? Not doing all the things married people do. Not doing all the things married people do. And then say, well... We still like each other. I guess the next step is getting married. Everybody can be sending this message to their kids, grandkids. If we want to know the specific call of God on our life, where to go to church, God tells us to go to church. He doesn't tell us what church to go to. We got to invite the Holy Spirit by following the general will of God. There's no gap year in church. I'm going to take some time and figure me out first. It sounds nice, and it even sounds offensive probably that I'm saying don't do that. I'm not saying don't heal. I'm saying don't heal in isolation. Heal with the two things that God left us to build what he's called us to build, the Holy Spirit and a small group in the church. Big life decisions that we have to make. Should I move here? Should I, should I take this job? Uh, sh should, I, should I reconcile with this family member? All these kind of things. What should I do, God? Are you living out the general will of God? And guess what? Sometimes we rush ourselves to make a decision. Oh, well, there's a deadline. I gotta. If God hasn't spoken on it in his general will, and if God is not prompting you, now there is a season sometimes where there's options and God's like, hey, why don't you make a choice? Absolutely. But there's also seasons where it's like, man, why don't I know what to do? Why do I not have clarity on what decision? Why am I so uneasy about this decision. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. Are you in the general will of God? Read your Bible. Pray. 
Get in the general will of God and watch how he speaks to the specific call for your life. If you want to experience the, the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit regularly, you need to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ constantly. Not even day by day, moment by moment. You might submit to the lordship today, but then work's over, you're tired. If you wait to submit to the lordship of Jesus again tomorrow morning, what, what, what does that leave the evening with? But submit to the lordship of Jesus moment by moment by moment by moment. And if we're ever uncertain what to do, maybe read here first before you decide. And then seek counsel. There's so many times I've, I've, I've talked with people and they're like, oh, I don't know, this seems... And, and my question back in some way, shape, or form is always, well, what's God speaking to you? Nothing. I've been praying. I've been asking Speak to me, show me, Lord. You can part the seas and tell me the answer. When he's saying, why don't you come meet with me? Why don't you come be with me? Why don't you come operate in the general will and I'll show you your specific will. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes this morning? I want to encourage you all this morning to be willing to ask and allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life. God, I thank you for everybody in this place this morning. Lord, whether it is a first time surrender, whether it is a fresh filling Fill us. If you came here this morning, maybe you're in the place where we, we talked about during worship where you feel like maybe you're just losing power. I want to encourage you in this moment, downshift. The downshift sounds something like this. Jesus, I need your help. I need your power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus before. You've never had that initial moment of surrender. There's, there's nothing magical about the words, but it's about the heart that is turned toward Jesus in repentance to receive the forgiveness. All you need to do is say, Jesus, I give my life to you. I repent and turn from my sin and I turn to you and trust that you'll help me figure out life. I give my life to you. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' mighty name.